Keep politics out of our video games is a sentiment shared by many gamers across many genres. But is it actually possible to keep politics out of all video games? And what exactly do people mean when they say politics? There are constant cries from gamers of agenda pushing from both ends of the political spectrum. Leonard Boyarsky, co-director of The Outer Worlds, says that his game will be political but not politically charged. Now that sounds like a bit of a paradox, but bear with me. He seems to be suggesting that the game will have political themes and subject matter, but the game won't force the correct ideology on players. Speaking with VGC, Boyarsky said, I don't want people to think that this is a really hard politically charged game. It's supposed to be fun, it's supposed to be humorous. We don't want to set up straw man or anything and say, look how horrible this is. It's really about looking at all aspects of issues. The last thing we want to do is make a game that people feel is lecturing them. This does feel fairly contradictory, especially considering the heavy satire of capitalism and anti-corporate sentiments, both of which are political ideas. However, it seems like the point he's trying to make is that the game is going to show you a variety of political concepts and it's up to you as a player to decide which you align with. There are people in this game who have philosophies that I don't agree with and I take pains to make those people very likeable, very sensible and very believable. Then there are people in the game who say things I agree with who are perhaps not very nice to hang out with. While Boyarsky is reluctant to make overt political statements, Mike Pondsmith, the creator of the Cyberpunk universe, says everything is political, including Cyberpunk 2077. Everything's political, human beings are political, First we got food, then we got prostitution, then we got politics. And we might have gotten politics before prostitution, but I'm not sure. Basically, it's all political, but a big part of what Cyberpunk talks about is the disparities of power and how technology readdresses that. Cyberpunk as a subgenre is a particularly political area of fiction, so it's no surprise that the game will be overtly political. Pondsmith continued, highlighting how themes of power will be important in Cyberpunk 2077. A lot of 2077 is about that push between people who want to gain power from the corporations and their groups, and the people who have had a taste of their own freedom and are not going to go along with this. Boyarsky said the Outer Worlds story will be similar to Obsidian's 2001 RPG, Arcanum, of Steamworks and Magic Obscura and how it handles its racial issues. The story always comes down to the balance of power and how people get power and how they use it. We've been very careful, I've been very careful. These two things sound very similar, but one is meant to be political while the other one isn't. It seems like the distinction between The Outer Worlds and Cyberpunk 2077 is that one is satire while the other is a critique. Borowski said the story is not a critique of modern capitalism and is more about power and how power is used against people who don't have it. Pond Smith, on the other hand, said, I tell people Cyberpunk is a warning, not, hey, this is going to be great. In a different interview with VGC, Pond Smith said, there should be that moment of discomfort when thinking about what your character has become after multiple cybernetic augmentations. We found a sweet spot with Cyberpunk, which is, we make you think, but but we don't bog you down and give you an education. So basically, it comes down to, wow, isn't it funny how fucked up the universe is, versus, wow, isn't it terrifying how fucked up the universe is. I feel like Cyberpunk's gonna be more overt in saying, okay, here's a horrible dystopia, you're meant to think this is bad. You're not meant to like it, we're gonna show you bad things, and you're meant to say no, yeah. stop the bad things. The Outer Worlds is gonna be a bit more satirical and be like, here's a bunch of bad things, but it's funny, so it's not all doom and gloom. It's not too terrible, but it's pretty bad. Yeah, and this is a conversation that games journalists always push this agenda, especially on Ubisoft games, because Ubisoft are always criticised for not not being political, not trying to send a message, which, for, for my money, I think it's a waste of energy. I mean, at the end of the day, this is a game, this is a hobby. You don't do it to get all serious about stuff. Games journalists might want everyone to be serious, might want to save the world in their own little way. For God's sake, let me just play a game and get on with it, right? I mean, it might, it might be very difficult to not have any sort of politics in a game. And what people don't like in games is when a game is trying to lecture you, a game is trying to tell you how to think. A game is giving you a, ju a, um, a judgment on what, what is good and what is bad. Nobody wants that shit. Nobody wants to be lectured. And I think both of these games are going to be like that. The Outer Worlds is more like a sandbox type of a, a game where you can choose to ally with whoever you want, the baddies or the goodies, or, you know, who's supposed to be the baddies. You could, you know, you know, you could be the baddie, you could be um, affiliated with the goodie. It's, it's up to you. Goodie, goodie, baddie. Sound like a four-year-old kid. <laughs> You're um, the goodie, daddy. <laughs> the goodies. Let's be the goodies. Um, and Cyberpunk is, is going to be a little, a little bit more gritty, but still not going to lecture you like Mike Pondsmith says. I'm happy with both those 
types of games. I'm happy with the way Ubisoft does it. I'm happy with, you know, there's there's no lecturing, there's no political charge whatsoever. There's always going to be politic, political themes in games. You can't distinguish that. It's humanity. That's what humanity does, right? It deals with political things. But it's not always politically charged and they're always trying to tell you things. And journalists, for God's sake, stop trying to force any sort of agenda into games because it's bullshit. And you shouldn't do it because you just... I, I, what, what is it? I don't know. You're not going to save the world. Just let it be. So you can include themes of politics in the stuff. That's one of the reasons Star Wars is so successful, the original trilogy, because they had loads of politics in that. The Empire, it, they're literally a political party. It's literally what they are, and you, you, they're, their heroes stop them. But when, when the new ones come out, it's way more over, and there's uh, social politics, and that sort of thing is what people get upset with, because it's that's when it feels agenda pushing. Yeah. But please make sure to let us know what you think down in the comments. Do you think either of the, these games are actually political? Do you think they should be political? Should games always be political like Ubisoft games? Let us know. Now it's time for some news nuggets. The Call of Duty franchise is often criticised for not innovating enough between its yearly instalments. Well, quit your complaining, you entitled bunch of toxic bellends. Reloading while aiming down the sights is the brand new feature coming to Call of Duty Modern Warfare this year. And and yes, that's Call of Duty Modern Warfare, not to be confused with Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare or Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, if only they could innovate with a clearer naming system. Toxic Bellend, I think you you might want to go and get that checked out. It doesn't really sound <laughs> too healthy. For that one. Yeah, right? <laughs> Spider-Man PS4 is one of Sony's best-selling games ever, and developer Insomniac Games has done a great job supporting it post-launch. To coincide with the release of Spider-Man Far From Home, the two new suits from the movie have been added into the game as free DLC in an update. You can now don the tactical black stealth suit, as well as the new black and red upgraded suit, which is now my personal favourite Spider-Man outfit altogether. Go see the movie, it's spectacular. Fortnite's latest crossover event comes with Stranger Things themed goodies. Players will be able to unlock Hopper and Demogorgon organ themed skins and vine weapon wraps, but there are no new game modes this time. The critically acclaimed and quite frankly excellent 80s sci-fi show kicked off its third series yesterday on Netflix. The long rumoured Nintendo Switch Mini may have just had another leak. This one comes from a tweet which shows an image of a silicone cover for the Mini Switch 2. Despite being the Mini version, the leaked image seems to depict a larger screen, something which Switch users have been asking for since the original launched back in 2017. People can fly the studio behind the criminally underappreciated Bulletstorm are keen on the idea of doing a sequel. CEO Sebastian Wojciechowski said, We want this IP to have its second life. We're still not sure what that means, but obviously since it's our IP, we own the IP, and the IP is known and has its fans. We would like to do something about it. They don't have any immediate plans for the franchise while they work on their new IP, Outriders with Square Enix, but if you want more Bulletstorm, it's coming to the Switch at the end of August. The original Overcooked game is now free to claim on the Epic Games Store. The fun multiplayer cooking sim from Ghost Town Games, which was released in 2016, is now available for free until next week. If that game isn't quite to your taste, next week the game Torchlight will be taking over as Epic Games Store's free game. Grab them while they're hot. Food puns. You're welcome. <laughs> Red Dead Redemption 2 has been rumoured to be coming to the PC for a long while, with one ex-Rockstar employee listing the PC version on their LinkedIn profile. And if that wasn't concrete evidence enough, now we may have even more solid evidence that a PC port is in the pipeline with this nugget posted to Twitter yesterday. User Jack O'Mako found mention of the PC version in the Social Club source code, and it reads as follows, RDR2 underscore PC underscore accomplishments. PC port confirmed. Going back to Cyberpunk again, Mike Pondsmith has raised everyone's hopes for a potential cyberpunk movie. Speaking with VGC at E3, he said, With Keanu Reeves being tied up in things, it's become much more of a possibility. He also mentioned a cyberpunk film wouldn't be as cerebral as something like Blade Runner, but it wouldn't be totally action either. And while we're on the subject, speaking to GameSpot, a CDPR representative has clarified that the company isn't actually working on three cyberpunk projects, as previously reported. CDPR apparently have two teams on cyberpunk, one team on R&D, one team on Gwent, and one team on a mystery mobile game. The misunderstanding, apparently, was caused by a bad Google translation. So that's it for your news nuggets. If you want to follow up on any of those stories we've just covered, as well as the two bigger ones, head on down to the description below. Now, 
Shall we have a bad dad joke? Let's do it. So these bad dad jokes come from our bad dad jokes channel on Discord, which you get access to if you become a Patreon over at patreon.com forward slash pretty good gaming. And you'll also get early access to our podcast at the end of today. But if not, you'll have to wait until Sunday. Okay, this might be a little bit touchy since it's still fresh. Um, but Frozen Monkey uh, delivers today's joke. Uh, so brace yourselves. If you don't have a sense of humor, probably skip this bit. The police have identified the body of the 24-year-old man who fell from a plane over London. He's been named as I'm in your flower bed. His friends have described him as a very nice bloke, very down to earth. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually a genuine good joke. But uh, like yeah. I said, if you're susceptible to be offended by jokes, you probably shouldn't have heard that. Anyway, let's move on. It was funny. Go Deal on. with it. <laughs> If you look on the Steam Store page of any Paradox Interactive Grand Strategy game, you'll likely be met with a long list of microtransaction purchase options. For example, Europa Universalis 4, a game which was released in 2013, has 32 bits of DLC listed on the Steam Store page. If you include the base game, the full EU4 experience will set you back a whopping £215.29, pence, and that's just a single example. On the one hand, many players feel that this is an extortionate way of treating your player base. That chopping up content like this into dozens of microtransaction payments is unfair. Players should be treated with respect and not milked for every tiny piece of content. On the other hand, some people feel that this is actually a fair way to fund the continued production of additional content in the games. After all, developers need to get paid for their time. Well, yesterday, former CEO of Paradox and current executive chairman of the board, Frederick Wester, jumped to defend the company's monetization practices in a series of tweets. Our DLC model is based on the idea that you pay for new content after the full game release. This helps to finance the further development of the game, which is of gain for all players. Every time we release a DLC, we also release a big update for free, which means that you get continuous upgrades of your game even if you choose not to buy any DLC. This would not be possible to fund otherwise. I know this is not a flawless model and that a lot of new players get intimidated by seeing a game with hundreds of dollars in DLC. However, we also run deep discounts on our games and DLCs regularly. I I feel I really want everything, but I don't think it's worth the price, like with all business. If you don't think it's worth it, don't buy it. Paradox should not be an exception. And now for the grand finale, I am personally in favour of DLCs that are purely enhancements of graphics, skins, flags, etc. Why? They have no gameplay effect, pay to win, doesn't lock out functions and helps fund the game and make it better. Incidentally, it was just recently that Wester himself described Steam's 70-30 revenue split policy as outrageous. Many people probably think the same about Paradox's DLC policy. Truth is that there are many models for monetizing post-release content in games. Not all of them require additional purchases whatsoever. For example, Sony have employed their 100% free model so far in their recently released and constantly updated Days Gone. Also, No Man's Sky has been constantly updated for years post-launch free of charge, to the point where the game is now a universe away from where it was when it launched. Others will charge you for each and every additional piece of new content, but Paradox's way is sort of a middle ground. Charge you for most of the stuff, but deliver some of it for free. Who is right? Who is wrong? Are players being fleeced? Or is this fair monetization? I've purposefully left my own opinion out of this segment so that maybe you can let us know what you think down in the comments. There's one way that they could fix this and stop people talking about Paradox's DLC um, practices. It's just taking all those microtransactions out of the Steam store and just putting them in the game itself, in an in-game store. So that, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind. People won't complain about it. I'm sure a lot of games do that. That's one way to fix it so that, you know, you don't get intimidated by the hordes and hordes, like dozens, dozens of microtransactions. You should, it's just, it just flooded, floods the whole page and it just puts you off wanting to buy again because you know you're going to have to pay over £200 for the whole thing. I think this sort of thing comes down to how good value the core thing is. And obviously that varies between person to person. If you play a five-hour game, and it's the best thing in the world. That's great value to you because you've had like a good connection with it. If you play a 100 hour game, but it was crap, it's no value. Mm. So it, it's, that's a really personal distinction that I don't think anyone can just decide, no, this is, yeah. this is you know, arbitrarily bad. One thing with, well, the, the, one of the main defenses of these grand strategy games as in you get value for your money from the core game. Like you could play the core game for over you know, a couple of hundred hours maybe because it's you know, these sandbox games that you could just put loads and loads of time in, into. So that is probably worth your money in this case, whereas other types of games, other genres of games, might you might not think so. But I can't help but think he's been a little bit hypocritical calling Steam's monetization 
uh, or their, their policy outrageous, whereas he's defending, yeah, yeah, we like DLC, DLC's fine, we make loads of money off it. It's like, he doesn't ever consider that, I, I mean, this is the main point why I don't like this, and like, up until now, I've been pretty neutral, right? But I hate it because what it does is it incentivizes them to release a bare bones core game to begin with, not go to go not go into depth with the game, just so that they can get the get out the door early, charge money for it, and then just plan to make more money or additional money over time um, that you've got to pay for. Rather than taking an extra year or two to develop the game as a full complete, you know thing that you don't need any ad additional things on top of that's value for money in the first place um, they decide to do it this way and, and and this kind of model incentivizes that type of approach which i hate i hate feeling like things were stripped out of my game and that sold back to me at a later date this is how you get left feeling with this type of model like over 200 pounds for the for the full experience nah count me out of that especially when there's so many examples who can do it for free and they still manage to stay afloat and no man's sky uh, the reason i put that no man's sky um example in there is because they make more money additional money by more people buying the game to see what's changed in the game they've got no microtransactions in that game they've charged nothing for the updates they've had a huge update recently which completely changed the game took it from first person to third person made it an entirely different type of game they're adding multiplayer this year they're adding vr all sorts of stuff absolutely free you can pick up for 20 quid now and they continue to make loads and loads of money why can't they do if it works for them why couldn't it work maybe it's because they don't sell as much because it's a more of a niche um market i don't know um, total war three kingdoms tended to do seemed to do really well this year when it launched it sold millions and it was the best played game on steam so don't tell me that grand strategy games are a niche market they won't sell as many because um three kingdoms was proving you wrong anyway that's just what we feel any of your own thoughts leave them down in the comments below if we've left any information out if we're just stupid and just don't get it let us know why don't you if you enjoyed the content and want to support the channel why not hit the thumbs up button why not leave a comment why not hit subscribe why not even hit the bell and if you're a super 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 fan and you really 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 enjoyed it you can head over to patreon.com forward slash pretty good gaming and from as little as one dollar per month you can support us bring you this content incidentally on this week's podcast we do discuss frederick wester and his thoughts on the 70 30 split and we go into that in depth you can get early access to that right now if you're a patron member otherwise you're gonna have to wait until sunday also you can get access to the patron discord on, as a patron member and you get to chat with us and read the awesome bad dad jokes so that's it for today's episode we will see you again next time until then bye for now and i didn't say pons moth once pons moth or pons moth pons moth pins mouth ceo sebastian worsichowski 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 fucked it <laughs>